Many years ago, I was walking on the boardwalk of Venice Beach when I saw this new kind of poster called Magic Eye. People were staring at it and commenting on how they could see a shark or a dinosaur pop out from the image, which of course I couldn't see until someone explained the technique for seeing it. This kind of a poster is called an autostereogram because it can create a 3D or stereo image. Stereo is the Greek word for a solid as opposed to a plane. So that a sphere is a circle in stereo and a cube is a square in stereo. In order to see Zacchaeus' story in stereo, we need to make two crucial literary assumptions. But we are on safe ground in making these assumptions because it appears the New Testament writers themselves made the same assumptions when they interpreted Old Testament stories. The first assumption is that all details are selective and meaningful. Bible stories are told economically, meaning that they don't give us much information. So what details are included are selective and meaningful. For example, Zacchaeus offers to give half his wealth to the poor. Why is this detail included in the story? It's not as though he wouldn't have been saved without it, or even that every Christian should do the exact same thing upon their conversion. When the blind beggar is converted in the previous story, we aren't told that he did anything special like Zacchaeus does. So why is it included? It probably relates to the story before the blind beggar. That was the story of a rich man whom Jesus commanded to give his wealth to the poor, but the rich man refuses and goes away sad. In the case of Zacchaeus, Jesus doesn't command him to do anything with his wealth, but on Zacchaeus' own initiative, he chooses to give half of it to the poor. My point isn't to explain why all this might be important, but only to show that the detail of Zacchaeus giving up half his wealth turns out to be highly selective and relevant in its context. The second assumption is that all details, when collected together, form a coherent and complete picture. However seemingly unrelated on the surface some details may appear to be, they function together to create a larger unity like the connect-the-dot pictures where a massive dot seem chaotic until you connect them in their proper relationships to create a larger unified whole. This unity applies to each story as well as to each larger group of stories and ultimately to the whole gospel. Consider the two details in Luke chapter 17 verses 11 and 12. First, the geographical detail that Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And second, that Jesus was met by ten lepers. Is the geographical setting related at all to what happens in the story, or can we just toss it aside? Well, lepers in that culture were expelled from normal society so long as they remained lepers, and were forced to live in the borderlands between population centers. This is precisely the kind of location one would expect for Jesus to encounter lepers. Furthermore, the specific territories mentioned are Jewish Galilee and Samaria. There wouldn't normally be much association between the Jews of Galilee and the Samaritans because of historical and cultural hostilities. Yet their unfortunate bout with leprosy has brought these ten Jewish and Samaritan lepers together into a rare, close association, which proves to be crucial as the story unfolds. Again, the point here isn't to explain all this, but only to show that seemingly unrelated parts collect together to create a coherent and complete whole.